Recently, I've been confronting Facebook memories with a slight pain in my chest. Those photos, videos, or posts that the site digs up from the past and then shoves right back in your face as if they were happening today are making me ask questions like, why did I think wearing that was a good idea? <laughs> or, wow, I really wanted to forget about that person. <laughs> but I've also been forced to ask some more unusual questions like, can I keep this? Is it convincing? Do I look like a boy? My name is Gabby Santos, and I identify as male transgender. When you refer to me, I'd really appreciate it if you could use he and him pronouns. I was born in Manila, Philippines, to two loving parents. I was their firstborn daughter, and they even bought me tiny baby earrings. But growing up, I spent a lot of time with two older boys, my cousins. And they treated me as an equal, inviting me to play the same games, taking turns on a scooter or skateboard. We even wrestled. And it didn't matter that I was a girl. In elementary school, my friends and I would play this hand clapping game. And this game essentially introduced us to the different gender identities that were recognized in the Philippines at the time. In mostly Tagalog, which is my language, and some English, it went like, girl, boy, baklatom, boy, butikiba, boy. Girl, boy, baklatom, boy, butikiba, boy. And this translates to girl, boy, gay, tomboy. And then we moved on to body shapes, lizard, and pig. Clearly, there is so much more to this list. But that's all we knew as kids. What we held in our small hands was an example of society's incomplete understanding of gender. Some years after that, I attended an all-girls high school. Initially, I wasn't sure how people would react if I told them that I liked girls. But turns out, I wasn't the only one. And eventually, there was like a lesbian couple in each class. And we had something in common. Other than the fact, of course, that we liked girls, we made this distinction. Who's blue and who's pink? We would literally ask that, blue or pink. It was this idea that there needed to be a feminine and a masculine partner. I was blue, in case you couldn't guess. Because, of course, heteronormativity had to exist even within same-sex couples. Eventually, I learned about the so-called alphabet soup, LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer, and we're even adding more letters now. But when I was younger, I remember we talked a lot about the L and the G, brought it up like in our hand clapping game, but we didn't talk about the B, T, or Q. I'm not sure about you, but I knew what those letters stood for, but I never knew what they meant. And then in December 2014, like a true millennial, I started this account on a blogging site. It was winter break, so I had lots of time to spend exploring this new site. I learned that the day I decided to create this account was the same day that a 17-year-old girl had decided to take her own life. Her name was Leela Alcorn. She was born male, but identifies as female. Part of Lila's note, which she shared online, read, I feel like a girl trapped in a boy's body. And I felt that way ever since I was four. I didn't know that there was a word for that feeling, nor was it possible for a boy to become a girl. And so I never told anyone about it and just continued to do traditionally boyish things to fit in. When I was 14, I learned what transgender meant and cried of happiness. Lila's post was for me at 21, that same revelation. I wanted to cry of happiness. Have you ever wanted to do a Google search but never really knew what keywords to use? That's exactly how I felt for a long time, except with my entire identity. So in that moment, I felt really excited and overwhelmed because I finally began to understand myself. All of the people who honored Leela's death made me see how rich the trans community is, and most importantly, that I could be a part of it. Yet at the same time, I was entering this community at the moment of loss. It became clear early on that the same transgender identity and the experiences that brought us together 
would also make us want to tear our own selves apart. So what do I do with this identity? Where do I go from here? As Lila ended her note, she wrote, my death needs to be counted among the number of transgender individuals who commit suicide this year. I want someone to look at that number and fix it. In giving this talk this afternoon, I hope to honor that request in my own small way. You've just heard how I've been interacting with gender and gender identities from childhood to the present day. In the remainder of our time together this afternoon, I wanna share with you a game that I've been playing my whole life, how it can be problematic, and what we can do to change some of its rules. So what is the game? The game really is composed of two parts, how I see myself and how others see me. If I see myself as a young man, but you here in the audience don't, then I've lost. And so I play. The game can be complicated as there are many different categories like building a masculine shape, food and fitness, hair, appropriate clothing, face. Since I started playing, I've been trying to lower my voice. There's this morning routine that involves a low humming sound to try to get my vocal cords to vibrate. I've also been binding or putting on this tight undershirt made mostly of nylon and spandex that helps flatten my chest. I've also attempted, and that's the keyword, to lift weights at the gym. <laughs> I got myself my first suit and tie for going to work. As I got more and more comfortable with everything that I was doing, it was no longer about looking like a guy. I wanted to be a hot guy. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to look good. I wanted to look good. <laughs> but physical appearance was just one aspect, one component of this game that I now had to play. Once I got that down, I wondered, well, how was I supposed to be? I mean, I'm still the same person that my family and friends have always known, but did I have to change my behavior now? Did I have to sit or walk differently? And this confusion manifested itself in very tricky ways, like staying in a stall in the men's room just a little longer, pretending to be doing number two instead of number one, so that people didn't have to wonder, why didn't I just use the urinal? That's when I realized that I wasn't a beginner at playing this game. In a society where gender norms and gender expectations are learned from such a young age and in very subtle ways, I've actually spent the last 23 years of my life being trained for this game, whether or not I was aware of it. In transgender lingo, the ability to be perceived by others as male or female and not transgender is called passing. And that's what I was trying to do. I'm playing a game and I'm playing to win. But as I kept playing, I began to realize just how problematic this game really is. While it's important for me to pass as male, I am standing here totally complicit in the game. In trying to win, I contribute to perpetuating dominant gender ideals and gender stereotypes, as well as privilege within the trans community and in broader society. Imagine yourselves in a gender other than the one with which you identify. Think, would you speak with a higher or lower pitch? Would you cross your legs while sitting? How? And what kinds of activities might you enjoy doing? Society has a really hard time acknowledging anyone who deviates from the script. There are rewards to maintaining gender expectations, and then there's also policing. In Thailand, around five years ago, um, this is a country that's usually thought of as tolerant of trans individuals. There was an airline that claimed to be the first in the world to hire openly transsexual flight attendants. That's great. But at the same time, they paired the transsexual new hires with natural born women for training. There was strong pressure to conform to feminine stereotypes and to perfect the feminine persona, when really there are so many ways for oneself, for one person to express themselves. Gender as a concept is so powerful because the more we perform it, the more it becomes second nature. It affects even the smallest of things, like how we perceive color. 
when I was 11 years old, my mom and I got into this huge argument about a pink button-down shirt. She wanted me to wear it, but in my eyes, it was too feminine, and I did not want it touching my skin. So I threw a huge tantrum. And eventually, in her frustration, she ripped the shirt open, and if I close my eyes, I can still see all of those buttons scattering all over the floor in my room. You can imagine how surprised and confused I was when sometime after that, I heard someone say, well, tough guys wear pink. Despite all of this confusion, I'm really one of the lucky ones. I have a certain degree of passing privilege, which means that I can pass relatively easily compared to other transgender folks. I am able to buy certain clothes and accessories that help me pass. I have access to healthcare and counseling. Other transgender individuals have a much more difficult journey. Society comes up with these strict gender norms and we, the trans community, have to pay. At Middlebury, we like to think of ourselves as pretty progressive. Many classes have now incorporated preferred gender pronouns in introductions. But when people match the gender identity that we assume they are presenting, we think subconsciously, oh, of course she's a she or he's a he. But when that's not the case, some people, like me, stand out. These introductions are a step in the right direction for sure. But at the same time, they heighten the stakes in this game for transgender individuals by reminding us just how important it really is to pass. In a perfect world, none of this would matter. Transgender folks would be loved for who we are as individuals and not what we look like or whether we passed or how well we embody the gender that we identify with based on society's norms and expectations. Playing this game would be completely unnecessary. But at the same time, it's not just transgender individuals who are constrained and measured against dominant gender ideals and gender stereotypes. It affects every single one of us. Men and women, for example, are shown idealized images of how they're supposed to look and get sick trying to pursue them. Men are given mixed messages about forming intimate relationships with one another, and women in the workplace are still subjected to an outdated view that says they are incompetent. Everyone is playing the game, but we don't have to be. When someone tells you or makes you feel that you have fallen short of that dominant ideal of the gender that you identify with, it's okay. Be kind to yourselves, but don't stop questioning. We should ask ourselves, when is gender important? When is it appropriate? In which contexts do we need it? And I don't have all the answers to these questions, but as we learn and interact with one another, I know we can strengthen our communities. Do you know how sometimes when we have to make big decisions in life, we like to anchor them onto things that are out of our control? That's exactly what I did when I signed up for this TEDx student speaker competition. I told myself, if I won, I would come out to my parents. It was go big and call home. The conversation I had with them was really healthy for our relationship, and they reaffirmed how much they loved me. But there are still many hurdles to cross. And just as I patiently journeyed through self-acceptance, my family will be doing the same. And I hope that we can all patiently move towards a world in which gender identity is just one small part of a larger identity. One aspect among many others that together make us who we are. When I think about how we identify and label ourselves as well as others, I like to imagine this block with a spectrum on it. And you cut it into parts, and then four, and then eight, and then you keep cutting and cutting and cutting until the parts are so small and the divisions so thin that when you take a step back, we begin to see that there are no divisions at all. It begins to look like one whole block again, a fluid spectrum, a society in which gender is identity and not performance. This game is much bigger than me or the transgender community. Everyone is playing it, but together 
we can change its rules. I know we can. Thank you very much. Yes.